the first slide is actually from Robert Nage, but I didn't take all of them. You know, so, but fortunately, he shares uh, my and obviously Peter's passion for the history of high altitude medicine research. And this is the first picture of Angelo, Ma one picture of Angelo Masso. Angelo Masso um, actually was the guy who convinced Queen Margherita of Italy to support the building of a high altitude laboratory on the Punta Gnifetti. And there was the first building uh, constructions uh, on the Punta Gnifetti. Um, and uh, the physiologist uh, Masso also conducted the first research on the Margarita Hut. And he labeled it, it was actually in Italian, I just translated it, or I tried, I did translate it, and it means cardiac fatigue at high altitude. There was the first publication um, that was coming out from Margarita research. So what did he see? He saw actually um, a translation or a different um, percussion model of the heart when Mountaineers rapidly ascend to the Margarita Hut, you know, and now we know that um, this change in heart position or heart morphology, anatomy, is uh, that it corresponds, the shift from A to B correspond, corresponds, corresponds to right ventricular dilatation in response to increased pulmonary ves vasoconstriction. And that's now uh, where, uh, how the Margarita Hut uh, looks these days. There was a picture we took two years ago uh, when I was uh, with a study team, which Mark Berger was um, leading, uh, going up to the Margarita Hut and um, yeah, uh, investigating the fact that Buddhism need, as Heimer mentioned earlier. But stick on hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, maybe less a cellular view, but more a clinical view of it. So there was the first uh, clinical description uh, of the effects of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So we have here Cattle, who um, was uh, first published in, a, uh, fifth, in 1915 um, as cattle went up to Colorado and developed clinical edema, and the edema was between the front legs and the head, which is known as brisket. That's why it's called brisket disease, and it was published, as I said, from Glover in 1915. The first um, studies in humans were a little later. It was like in Peru, in the Peru and Andes, in Morococha in uh, 4,540 meters, published by Rotta in 1956. And that's interesting overview of all the studies measuring pulmonary artery pressure and plotting it against altitude. It was published in 1979, and we see that, for example, animals as cows, cattle, have a marked increase in pulmonary artery pressure when you plot them against altitude. But human beings, the slope is far flatter. And it's the same if you plot pulmonary artery pressure against oxygen content, uh, arterial co oxygen content, uh, you see almost the same relation. So we can tell uh, from these studies that there is marked interspecies variability of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and subsequent hypoxic pulmonary hypertension, which we know is tightly linked. And we know that, uh, the, that, we, that human beings or human species have minimal hypoxic pulmonary hypertension uh, when we compare it to other animals. So stick on hypoxic pulmonary hypertension. These days we have cutoffs, we have uh, upper borders uh, in clinical medicine uh, in low altitude. It's uh, published two years ago. Is a is a mean pulmonary artery pressure of above 25 um, mercury of column. But when we go to high altitude consensus, um, published in High Altitude Medicine and Biology almost 13 years ago, it's a mean pulmonary artery pressure above 30 or a systolic pulmonary artery pressure above 50 uh, millimeters uh, of uh, mercury column. So um, maybe stick a little closer uh, to hypoxic pulmonary hypertension uh, and um, the range of it and the incidence. It's an interesting meta-analysis uh, which was published a couple of years ago, and the meta-analysis stick on uh, or studied um, apparently healthy high altitude dwellers. So dwellers mean people who actually live at high altitude. And uh, the assessment was made by um, echocardiographic estimation of systolic pulmonary artery pressure. And importantly, all the studies performed uh, or studied in the meta-analysis were performed between 3,600 and 4,350 meters. So based on the results, the study team um, made uh, these um, figures 
So distribution um, patterns, so that's of a control group at low altitude. So we see that around 18 millimeters uh, is the mean um, pulmonary artery pressure, systolic pulmonary pressure, and that's uh, the curve, the distribution of high altitude dwellers. So they are on the mean at 25. Still, you know, high altitude pulmonary hypertension in high altitude dwellers based on these um, cutoffs is very rare. So just 1% really had um, um, overcome these this, this barriers or these this cutoffs. Yeah. So these were like in healthy highlanders, but what about um, patients with chronic mountain sickness? So chronic mountain sickness or Monge's disease uh, was started to, or the, the group uh, started to investigate uh, this, uh, this illness was in Cerro de Pasco in Peru. And one of the study team, Mr. Bearcroft, um, said that all dwellers at high altitude are persons of impaired physical and mental power. That was his stated. Yeah? So look a little deeper in it, if it's true or not. So um, it's relevant. You know, heart, um, these days, or it's a, um, a figure from the uh, VHO from 2005, I guess, 140 million people live above 2,500 meters. That's a lot. So it's relevant. And around 5 to 10% are at risk of developing chronic mountain sickness, also clinical relevant. So what's the definition? Um, your, our, um, you, the definitions are from, uh, from last year, actually. Um, and they are natives or lifelong altitude residents above 2,500 meters. So it's a precondition. It's an excessive erythrocytosis defined by a hemoglobin above 21 grams per deciliters in males and above or above 19 grams per deciliters in females, and they have to have severe hypoxemia. If they fulfill these criteria, then they might have uh, chronic mountain sickness, but what is discussed is the pulmonary pressure. So we know from studies from Penalotza, um, an older one, that um, Patients with chronic mountain sickness, they are like the, the circle ones with, uh, where, with black filled ones, have much higher pulmonary artery, uh, artery pressure than healthy highlanders. So uh, increased pulmonary uh, artery pressure is one sign um, of uh, patients with chronic mountain sickness. So that's the average. The average in this study was uh, healthy highlanders 23 millimeters, and uh, in, in patients with chronic mountain sickness, it was 47 millimeters, so much higher. So Robert Naish um, is, is an excellent exercise pathophysiologist, uh, and that's why he uh, researched a little deeper uh, in the exercise-induced differences, and his studies were based uh, on these studies from Sima and Penatsula. Here is a picture of uh, these two colleagues. On the left side is Dr. Sima performing a, a right heart catheterization, just puncturing um, an antecubital vein. And uh, the um, uh, gentleman on the right side uh, is uh, Dante Penalitza. So what these um, colleagues did, they were, um, they were examining 11 Peruvian soldiers who were born in the highlands of Cerro Pasco. They made exercise right heart catheterization in Morococha as around uh, 4,250 meters, and after two years of continuous residence at Lima. So these soldiers, they were first uh, in Cerro de Pasco, but then were relocated to Lima where they uh, were staying for two years. So what were the results? Uh, when we look at the uh, results here in the, in the figures, we have mean pulmonary artery pressure, and here we have the cardiac index. So we plot um, pulmonary pressure against cardiac index, which is increasing due to exercise. So um, the line here um, with the steep slope is the reaction of highlanders at high altitude. So before they went to Lima. So we see that these um, soldiers, healthy highlanders, have a pretty steep increase of pulmonary pressure. You know, um, uh, when we plot them against cardiac index during exercise. This line here is after two years in Peru. So the slope is getting much flatter. So there's some kind of adaption or readaption going on, and this, uh, the solid line here are controls. Okay? So we can say um, uh, that, yeah, 
So when we use the definition of exercise pulmonary hypertension, we can say that healthy Highlanders do have exercise-induced pulmonary hypertension. So the uh, answer to the above question is yes. Yeah? Um, so when we come back uh, like to the statement of Mr. Barcroft, all dwellers of the high altitude are persons of impaired physical and mental power, maybe physical, we don't know yet, yeah? but it seems at least when Mr. Barcroft is right, seems to be reversible, then these highlanders go back to uh, lowland uh, altitudes. Based on this research, uh, Professor Naish uh, was uh, performing uh, another one in 2010, but it was uh, again performed at Cerro de Pasco. Um, he was driving the equipment with his team up to 4,350 meters. It's a picture of his team uh, with the same guy we were seeing in 1971 performing the, um, the right heart catheterization. still. Here is he, Penalosa, I guess is his name, uh, in this team. And he published it actually uh, a couple of years ago in CHEST. And uh, when we come shortly to the methods of the study, he examined 15 healthy Highlanders, 15 newcomer lowlanders, or were born and raised in lowlands and uh, going up uh, to uh, high altitude, and 13 patients with already chronic mountain sickness. And what this study group was doing uh, too was cardiopulmonary exercise testing among other uh, examinations. So what they, um, the study group um, published um, in, uh, in chest was also this figure here. So we see here again, pulmonary artery pressure. We see here increasing cardiac index um, with, with exercise. And they made a, uh, a matter, actually a review, a systematic review and, uh, of all the existing studies until 2012. And here we see the reaction the solid lines are like invasive measured pulmonary uh, uh, artery pressure, and uh, the dotted lines are echocardiographic uh, based examinations. And we see uh, an increase in cardiac uh, in pulmonary artery pressure with increasing cardiac index that we know. But if we go like to uh, to high altitude and patients like here and from this study from Penalza and Sima, we see a marked increase. Yeah, so the slope. Um, uh, of, uh, this re uh, of this relation is much, much cheaper, uh, much, much uh, steeper uh, in patients with chronic mountain sickness. Let's come to results of this study here. So first they had lowlanders at sea level. There was the reaction. You know? Then when we examine lowlanders at high altitude, it gets steeper. Highlanders, yeah, again, steeper, and the steepest slope was again. Yeah, and comparing to the previous study in patients with chronic mountain sickness. So exercise-induced pulmonary hypertension in chronic mountain sickness uh, and healthy highlanders, both as them, yeah, um, but less in healthy uh, lowlanders. But what they else um, published in this, uh, in this work uh, in CHEST was um, data based on the, um, on the cardiopulmonary exercise testing and what we see here is the V2 max. So it's an estimate of the aerobic capacity of a person. So we see uh, what's actually kind of surprising is that the V2 max of patients with chronic mountain sickness is comparable to those at, uh, of the highlanders and of the lowlanders at high altitude. So how comes? You know? The study team also made diffusion testing, yeah, diffusion for carbon monoxide uh, and nitrogen monoxide, uh, and we see clearly that patients with chronic mountain sickness and highlanders have a better diffusing capacity. And when we look at the baseline characteristics, we also see that patients with chronic mountain sickness have what we have expected, a much higher hemoglobin. So uh, when we summarize the, the, the data and the results, we see Patients with chronic mountain sickness have an elevated uh, pulmonary pressure at exercise. They have comparable VO2 max, meaning aerobic capacity, maybe based on better diffusing lung capacity and higher um, oxygen transportation capacity. So all the data I'm presented have some flaws, only one uh, from Mr. Naish, not because 
when we look at the consensus statement uh, on chronic and subacute high altitude disease um, published in High Altitude Medicine and Biology 2005, it says pulmonary hypertension at high altitude is defined by a mean pulmonary artery pressure higher than 30, that we know. But in the absence of excessive erythrocytosis. So that's the next study uh, Robert Naish was performing. There are like two equations, a linear equation uh, back in the days from 1933 and a new one from 1992, uh, an exponential equation, uh, which corrects the relationship between pulmonary pressure um, and uh, cardiac output for hematocrit. And what he did, he did he would take um, old results from pulmonary pressure, uh, increase in uh, chronic mountain sickness, patients and high altitudes, and if he corrects them, they get normal. And it's the same um, for the exponential equation. So I think it's very important for future research uh, that we uh, also look for the hematocrit and if we measure um, the relation between pulmonary pressure uh, and cardiac index, uh, that we also use one of these two formulas. And I guess that's what uh, Robert Nage wanted to tell us with this slide. The correction for hematocrit markedly decreases altitude pulmonary hypertension. So uh, let's switch um, a little bit from uh, the vessels because we, we, by now we know we have hypoxic pulmonary hypertension, you know, and we know that by increased um, uh, pressure, the um, afterload of the right ventricle is increasing. So the heart at high altitude has increased afterload. We also know that the right ventricle is susceptible to changes of pressure because the wall of the right ventricle is much thinner than the one from the left ventricle. We also know that when we go to high altitude, we have exercise, we have increased hematocrit, and that also adds on the pressure. So we have a constellation uh, where the right ventricle is maybe at risk, or it is challenged. So Robert Naish was asked by, uh, by um, Jack Cardiovascular Imaging if the right ventricle is doing well at high altitude, and if yes, is it doing always well? And he was um, answering the question in an editorial uh, published a couple of years in 2013. So I want to switch a little bit to our own data now, so maybe we can um, answer this question based on other study that we performed two years ago. So um, Heimo told us before it was actually a study on 50 healthy loneliness where we um, had the hypothesis that inhaled budesonide has an effect um, on um, the incidence and severity of acute mountain sickness. And I was the guy who was responsible uh, or in charge of the measurements of the pulmonary artery pressure. So here we are up in the Margarita hut uh, with our uh, uh, echo device and here one of our patients and I'm measuring not only the pulmonary pressure, I also looked at the right ventricle. So here we see the right ventricle, one of our patients, so that's a, a classical, it's not a classical loop, so I always try, you have to try to get uh, the best uh, shape of the right ventricle, but it's pretty challenging because the form is crescent, but this view is pretty important because by this loop you can measure the fractional area change of the right ventricle. You know? And the fractional area change is one estimate of systolic and diastolic right ventricular function. What else uh, did we measure? We uh, measured, of course, the pulmonary pressure. Here, one example uh, of this estimate we did uh, at the Margarita hut. What I also measured was the TAPSA. TAPSA uh, is actually the, um, the location difference of the lateral uh, analysis of the, tricuspid, uh, of the tricuspid, right? So you can measure it here, and it, it's an estimate for long systolic right ventricular function. What else uh, I did was measuring uh, tissue Doppler imaging. Um, by tissue Doppler imaging, you can measure the velocity of the lateral analysis uh, and the maximal velocity seen here on the top, on this point here, is also a surrogate of systolic right ventricular function. So we published the data um, uh, actually pretty recently. Uh, a couple of weeks ago in higher medicine uh, and biology. So uh, there are the three groups, placebo, brisonite, and uh, brisonite 200 and 800. And we see here the changes, uh, the increase in systolic 
pulmonary artery pressure here low altitude and then four time points at high altitude. Uh, Buddhism and I didn't have, have effect uh, on uh, this marker. When we look at the um, circuit or for the estimate of systolic longitudinal function, the TAPSA, we see a significant increase from low altitude to high altitude. The next um, so estimate uh, uh, S in the um, tissue double image, again, we see a marked increase in the contractility and systolic function of the right ventricle. If it take an estimate of both systolic and diastolic function, we didn't see any changes. So we go back to the, um, the question of Jack cardiovascular imaging. Is the right ventricle doing well at high altitude? Always well. It seems that in healthy lowlanders, global right ventricular function is preserved in hypoxic conditions to a positive systolic effect that may be counterbalance uh, po uh, negative diastolic effect that we know, don't know, right? But what about patients with chronic mountain sickness? So uh, this study group is going out to answer the question. Yeah? A recontractility and exercise-induced pulmonary hypertension in patients with chronic mountain sickness. It was recently uh, published in 2013 in Jack Cardiovascular Imaging. There were 46 uh, patients with chronic mountain sickness and 40 uh, high altitude dwellers. They were uh, living in um, uh, La Paz in Bolivia at 3,600 meters. They were measuring uh, the pulmonary pressure and the cardiac function and we're evaluating uh, these measures at rest and during semi-supine bicycle exercise. So the first data is the data on the morphology of the right ventricle, and uh, when we look at uh, rest between chronic mountain sickness and high uh, altitude dwellers, we see an increased basal and mid-RV diameter. So we have some kind of morphologic change um, in uh, patients with chronic mountain sickness. If we look at the exercise results, so there's, there's the change in uh, pulmonary artery pressure. Um, we see that the patients with chronic mountain sickness have an increased reaction to exercise that we actually do from other studies. Um, but the reaction um, to um, the fractional area change, one again, one estimate of uh, right ventricular function, did not change. Okay. So the right ventricular function seems to be preserved, and that's what they all uh, also concluded uh, from this study. The results of this study showed that in CMS patients with mild disease, the RV contractility is preserved, although RV remodeling was present in rest conditions. Again, our question is, RV is doing well at high altitude? Always? Well, when we go to this study from, published in Images in Cardiovascular Imaging uh, a couple of years ago, uh, one patient is a case report, actually. We had one patient um, who had right heart failure within 24 hours of arrival in La Paz at an altitude of 3,700 uh, 3, meters. And these are the echocardiographic results. We see in the left panel the inferior vena cava, and it's uh, dilated. Uh, so here's the, 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 the patient. Yeah? Um, they're like the baseline examinations, and that when he had the symptoms. So we say here the, the vena cava uh, uh, is markedly dilated. Then we see a uh, markedly increased um, pulmonary pressure of 80 millimeters uh, mercury, and we see a mid systolic deceleration that's a sign of pulmonary. Uh, of increased pulmonary pressure. And what's really impressive is this one, that's the right atrium. So it's markedly increased, so this patient has right heart failure. If you look at other studies, they're really sparse. So we have really little data um, on the right ventricle um, and, and the right ventricular heart failure syndromes at high altitude. Uh, so they are summarized with only seven um, publications so far who are dealing with this topic. So um, I want to conclude uh, my talk with that altitude-induced pulmonary hypertension is rare. So at least at high altitude dwellers, we uh, have just well, below 1% of people. The right ventricle is doing well at altitude, at least almost always. We do have some publications about acute and chronic right uh, heart failure at high altitude. Altitude 
pulmonary hypertension may be the cause of high altitude right heart failure acutely and chronically, but we do not know exactly now. And that's what I took from uh, Robert Naish's talk. Um, he was pointing at revision of high altitude definitions on pulmonary hypertension and uh, heart failure are needed, that we have to look at the hematocrite and that we have to standardize, standardize a um assessment. And last one is that we need population studies uh, to assess the public health impact of pulmonary hypertension with or without high altitude um, uh, right heart failure using survival or uh, quality of life measures. And I want to thank you guys.